<clears throat> continuing with the same thought of from last week that God be thanked of verse 17. <clears throat> because in verse 14, Paul says, you are not under the law because the law does condemn us. The law cannot deliver us from sin. The, the law, in fact, is brings us back into bondage. It puts us into despair. It There is no comfort in the law at all because by the knowledge of the law, you know what sin is and that cannot deliver you. And it's as though that you have no hope under the law. But then he says, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. And then jump to verse 17. He says, but God be thanked. Because he has brought you under grace, he has justified you, and he has freely justified you, he has made you righteous. By imputing the righteousness of Christ on you. And so he says, but God be thanked that you were servants of sin. He uses the past tense that you were servants of sin. But, you know, when God, the other reason he says, God be thanked, you go to Ephesians. We know it is God who regenerates us, who makes us alive. Because he says, but you have obeyed from heart that form of the doctrine and which was delivered unto you. That form of doctrine is nothing but the gospel here. Because he talks of the gospel of God in chapter 1 and the gospel of Christ. And that form of doctrine is about Christ, which is nothing but the gospel. So he says, how, how can you and I, who are dead in sin, who are God-haters, Turn with me to Romans 3. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understand it. And if I cannot understand, how can I obey from my heart that gospel which was delivered unto me? If that is not the work of God. God be thanked. Because he made you alive by the power of that gospel to break us one, on one side, a stubborn heart. On the other side, we who were dead in sins to respond to him. Just as he said, Lazarus, come out. Remember, every one of us were in that tomb. And, and God, and Christ calling us, Lazarus, come out. Gilbert, come out. <clears throat> and then we have all the grave clothes tied around us with our legalism. We need to remove each one of those. And God is in the process of doing that in our life. And then he says in verse 18, being made free from sin. And yet, we know that we are not yet free from sin. If any man says he is without sin, he is a liar. But in the presence of God, because of Christ's imputed righteousness, I am righteous. Position, positionally, I am righteous. And God looks at me as righteous because I have been justified. How does God do that amazing that he looks at us just as he looks at his beloved son, Jesus Christ. That's the power of the gospel. To impute Christ's righteousness on me and to justify me That sin does not have dominion and that I am made free from sin. And then he goes on to say, you became servants of righteousness. 
and you can think of a couple of things. Number one, we became servants of righteousness because of Christ in righteousness. Number two, God, the Spirit, indwells in us who is righteous. He is the righteous Spirit. And He causes us to be to seek after righteousness, who is none other than Christ, to seek after my master. Jesus says, servant cannot be greater than his master. Yet, the servant is always at the side of his master. And that is the gospel, brothers, to go, run to Christ, to be to look to Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, to always think of Christ who is my righteousness. For he is, and, and the Holy Spirit constantly points us to Christ <clears throat> and brings us to memory the things of Christ. So, so Paul, Paul till verse 18 is talking of how God is looking at us. He looks at us as servants of righteousness. He looks at us as he looks at his beloved son. He looks at us as though we were the ones who obeyed the gospel, yet the reality is he is the one who caused us, who drew us, who broke our stubborn hearts. And he imputed Christ's righteousness. But on the other side, Paul is coming to the reality here in verse 18. He says, but I speak after the manner of men. I speak in human terms. I speak because as we say, when the rubber hits the road, then we know what exactly it is. Verse till we can say, God be thanked for all that he has done for us. And then we look at the mirror of the scriptures and look at myself. He says, I speak after the human terms or after the manner of men because of the weakness of, of your flesh. Your flesh is still weak. Your flesh still wants to go after your own self-righteousness, number one. Your flesh still wants to obey sin. Because this flesh is still corruptible. This flesh still has the DNA of Adam, our father. And yet in Christ, we are all saved. We are all perfectly righteous. But you look at yourself, we are filthy rags. Because our flesh is so weak. Our flesh cannot keep anything of God's command. Our flesh cannot love anything of God. And he says, for you have yielded or presented your members, slaves to uncleanness and to iniquity and unto lawlessness or unto iniquity. Even so, now yield your members, servants to righteousness and to holiness or present yourself to holiness. He's saying the reality is you are still in your flesh. And this exactly complements what John what John is saying in 1 John. Just let, let us turn to 1 John. 
and we know that verse so well, but let's look at it. Let me read from verse 5. This then is the message, message which we have heard of him and declare unto you. And what is that message? It's the gospel that we have heard about Christ and declare unto you that God is light. And you remember 1 John begins with that. That Jesus is that light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. And then if we say we have fellowship with him and walk it in darkness, we lie and do not know that do not and do not the truth or do not practice the truth. So in other words, John is saying, Light and darkness cannot go together. And then immediately, verse 7, if we walk in the light, and mark those words, how many ifs are there in John's saying? If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and he says, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And, and the word, it's not sin because it is sin singular. Because if we break one commandment, we are broken everything and we are sinners. Keeping that in mind, go to verse 6 now. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. That is like having dual citizenship. But rather, when I say I have fellowship with him, the reflection or the mirror that I see and I see myself and I know that there is sin in me and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me from all sin. And then I have fellowship with him. How do I have fellowship with him? It's because of the cleansing through the blood of Christ. Yet on the other side, verse 8, he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. That is the works of darkness. So there has to be a constant cleansing in our life in the blood of Christ that we constantly have fellowship with him. And he says the truth is not in us. And uh, or, and we do not practice the truth. Do we, do we become holy, perfectly holy? Absolutely not. Are we cleansed? Yes. And we are being constantly cleansed. And verse, and just turn back to, to verse, uh, verse 18 of Romans 6. He says, being made free from sin is nothing but being constantly cleansed by the blood of Christ. That is the gospel. And then come come back to 1 John. And then he says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us. To forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
even our legalistic righteousness is ready to forgive us. That is the great clothes that we need to untie. Verse 10, if we say we have not said, we make home a liar. We make God a liar and his word is not in us. So come back to Romans 6. He says, I speak after the manner of men. I speak after human terms. When I look at myself, he, he goes, uh, he says in uh, chapter 7, verse 24, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Because the wages of sin is death, and he knows he's full of sin. Who shall deliver me? When I look at myself, can I say I'm righteous? Can I say I'm servant of righteousness? When I look at myself, can I say I'm obeying my new master perfectly? When I look at myself, can I say I've obeyed the gospel perfectly which was delivered unto me? He says, because the weakness of our flesh we are God haters. We don't seek after we don't seek after God. We have gone astray like sheep. We have become unprofitable. There is none that do it good, no, not one. Even to seek after God is a good thing, but we don't do that. Basically, we seek after God for. All other reasons except for who he is and except for forgiveness of sins. Unless God has made sin exceedingly sinful that we run to him. How is the truth? Open sepulchre. We have deceit. We have the poison of acts under our lips. Yet, when God has justified us, he has made us righteous, one side, and then the other side, we have to come to, like Paul says, we have to come to the real terms. We are still weak in our flesh. But God be thanked, for he has given us his spirit to dwell in us, to constantly to remind of Christ. But God be thanked for the for the scriptures. God be thanked for the gospel constantly that we get to hear. But God be thanked for the fellowship that we have among the brethren. God be thanked for the prayers that we pray for each other, knowing each other very well. He says, for as ye have yielded or presented your members slaves to uncleanness. You may say, oh, I don't have not committed adultery, but the lust with your eyes is before God is committed adultery. You, you may say, I have not murdered, I have not gone to jail. But your anger has murdered so many people. And to iniquity, unto iniquity. How many times our thoughts have been so evil about others? Though we may not have acted, but still, it is there. But how can I yield my members 
slaves to righteousness and to holiness. If it's not by the sovereign power of God who has dragged you unto himself, he has dragged you against your own will because we are not ones to seek after God. God be thanked for that. So Paul goes on to say in verse 20, he says, when you were servants of sin, you were free to right, uh, you are free from righteousness because you were dead in your sins. You did not know what righteousness is all about. But what can a dead man hear? What can a dead man do or what can a dead man see? Can dead men speak and say, oh, that's, that's good and that is bad? Dead men, in fact, stinks. Those who are alive will run away. So he says, when you were slaves of sin, you were free from righteousness. But now God, but God be thankful, God has made you alive and made you a servant of righteousness. Even understanding your weak flesh, he has given you his spirit to indwell in you. To con and he has given you the gospel and to constantly run to the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 21, what fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. I would include all righteousness of the flesh also in this. All the works righteousness that we talk of. What fruit had you then in those things? Whereof that you are now ashamed. Turn with me to Philippians. Chapter 3. Paul would have boasted of his trust in the flesh. Verse 5, circumcised in the eighth, the, circumcised the eighth day, I, I kept the law so perfectly, my parents did it on exactly the eighth day, as was commanded. A stock of Israel I'm not a mixed breed of the tribe of Benjamin, the first king who was chosen from that tribe. Benjamin, beloved of Isaac, of that tribe. A Hebrew of Hebrew perfectly as touching the law a Pharisee concerning zeal persecuting the church. Look at our righteousness. What are you what are you all talking of? You're following a man. Touching righteousness which is in the law, he says blameless. None of us were so close to Paul. Yet he says in Romans 6.21, he says, for the end of those things is death. And Paul here in 
Philippians, he says, but the things which were gained for me, I counted loss for Christ. He calls them dung. I do count them as dung, he says. Yes, we are sinners, one side, but there is something for far more poisonous than that is our self-righteousness. He says, for the end of those things is death. Verse 22. But now being made free from sin and have become, and mark those words, the way he says, being made free from sin, who has made you free from sin? But God be thankful, God has done it. And it's a continuous process. He is breaking the bondage of sin on our lives. And he is doing it so beautifully. And he, and he has made us to become servants of God. When we sin, the spirit of God, doesn't he convict us immediately? Yes, we may resist him for some time, but not for long. You have your fruit in holiness and the end is everlasting life. Where is my fruit? Because my root is Christ. And Christ who justified me and who gives me all the energy and the strength I require. And he is the one who lives my life and I'm hidden Christ. And the spirit constantly convicting, convicting me and exposing me. And God in his goodness giving me the gospel that I may run to Christ for the end is everlasting life because it is Christ in Christ do I live. So basically Paul is saying you have been justified brothers and sisters. God in his love and in his goodness has made you as clean as possible. He, made, he has made you spotless without blemish. Yet the reality, the other side of the reality is I'm still a, I'm still in sin and God has given me a means his precious blood that cleanses me from all our sins. Isn't it an amazing grace? For the wages of sin is death. And we all have to die to put off this corruptible, mortal, sinful body, dust to dust. That's why death is precious. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of a saint. Because we put off this corruptible body. No more slaves of sin. Once we put off this corruptible body. But, but God be thanked for the gift of God is eternal life. Look at what God has done. Yes. We are still sinners, but God has justified us and made us righteous. And he has given us the gift of eternal life. And that is only through Jesus Christ our Lord. Can I say, 
Jesus Christ our Lord, who's, who is my gospel. Turn with me to Romans 1, and I will close with this. Verse 15, for as much as is in me, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. And then he says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Because for it is the power of God unto salvation. For the wages of sin is death, but it is the power of God unto salvation to eternal life. Christ overcame the dead, grave. To everyone that believe it, who is the one who believes? John 6, verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God. What is the work of God? That you believe on him whom he has sent. Because God has caused you to believe on whom he has sent. That is Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. That's the power of God to save you. Unto eternal life. To the Jews first and, to the, and also to the Greek. Verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God. The go in the gospel is the righteousness of God where you have been made righteous and your sin is being imputed to Christ. So he says, reveal from faith to faith as it is written. You know why faith to faith? It's meaning it's a continuous process. We, every child of God needs to hear the con gospel constantly. The gospel is for his children. The gospel is not for unbelievers, but the gospel is for the elect. The just shall live by faith. The, the sheep hear his voice, that is the gospel, and they come to him. And the sheep need to constantly hear the gospel, for that is the power of God unto salvation. Men, because we constantly, as sheep, go astray. May God help us. To hear, may God enable us to hear the gospel constantly and may God strengthen us in that which we need to run to Christ constantly. Never to look at my flesh or to look at my works of righteousness, but to look at Christ alone.